Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you. I'm in your ears. You let me there. I appreciate it. Jeff Wilkes, Pele Glendale, Tim Deputy, and brand new patrons. We got three of them, everybody. Welcome, Exposure, Gautaman, and Kizel. On this episode of DTNS, Len Peralta gives advice on getting started as a digital artist, why Google is prioritizing its iOS apps, and YouTube can erase that copyright infringing song from your video, but not from your heart. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July the 5th, Dependence Day 2024 <laughs> in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Almost went with Cinco de Julio, which would <laughs> oh, it, it, yeah, it, yeah. it also is. Yeah. <laughs> Happy like, yeah. July 5th, everyone. Yeah. And congratulations to the UK on their new government. Oh. Those they do it fast over there. They like have the election in two months. They count the votes on the same day as the election, and the new person's in charge the next day. Efficient. Efficiency. That's you. That's <laughs> English efficiency that is. at work. World famous. Also Scottish and Welsh and Northern Irish, and Isle of Man and Guernsey. And the list goes. All right. All right. Uh, all right. Let's start with the quick hits. <laughs> Epic Games complained to the European Commission that Apple is being arbitrary in rejecting certifications for Epic's third-party app store. In the EU, Apple is required to allow third-party app stores, but can review them to make sure they meet security and other requirements. Epic says Apple has rejected its certification because the install button is too similar to the get button in the Apple app store, and the in-app purchase label is too similar to Apple's. Now, in response, Apple says the download button that looks too similar, uh, it, it wants to work with, it says it's the download button that looks too similar, rather, and it wants to work with uh, Epic to resolve the issue since the rest of the design is within the guidelines. So, seems like we're getting somewhere. Apple has already certified Epic's Fortnite to be available as a sideloaded app as well. Eleven Labs has reached agreements with multiple estates of celebrities who are dead to be able to use the voices of those dead actors to narrate whatever text you want if you put it in the new Reader app from Eleven Labs. Uh, all you do is upload a PDF or an EPUB or your email, whatever it is you want to read, whatever text, put it in the app, and you can choose to have one of multiple celebrities read it, including Judy Garland, Sir Lawrence Olivier, James Dean and Burt Reynolds. Eleven Labs Reader AI Audio is the name. It's available right now on iOS, and you can sign up for a wait list if you want to get it on Android. A French nonprofit lab called Kiute has released a chatbot called Moshi that says it has faster response times than OpenAI's GPT 4 O. It released a demonstration to show off its 200 millisecond response. However, Kiyote notes that it's optimized for speed, not accuracy. So it's kind of just a research prototype at this point. Uh, you make your jokes about how isn't that true of all of them. The 200 millisecond response time, that's pretty fast. Uh, usually we're talking seconds for the other ones. Always good to note when a new social app takes off, not because you need to necessarily sign up for it, uh, but uh, so you can understand what folks are talking about if it really gets popular. There is an app called No Place, N-O-P-L-A-C-E, No Place, that has hit number one on the App Store as of Wednesday. Offers bright, customizable profiles where you can share things like what you're listening to, your relationship status, etc. Uh, kind of reminds folks of early Facebook or MySpace. It focuses on text-based updates, does not support photos or videos, at least not at the moment. The idea is to share what you're currently doing, not talk about things in the past. So the feeds offer you your friends' posts or everyone on the app's post in reverse chronological order. There's no algorithm to how you get the feeds. You're just going to see the latest one. However, you can have a generative model summarize what you've missed since the last time you looked at the app. Cloudflare is offering a free tool for websites to use 
to use to stop their sites being indexed by bots without permission. This is meant to counter bots that don't respect the standard robot dot, uh, robots.txt file that tells a bot whether it's okay to index it or if it's not okay. Cloudflare's tool can detect if a bot is pretending to be something it's not, like a browser to avoid detection, for example. Cloudflare also uses fingerprints to detect those bots and block them. All right, that is <laughs> the quick hits. Uh, let's talk about a report from the information that Google is trying to increase usage of its own apps on iOS so that its search traffic won't be entirely relying on the default search engine in Safari. Uh, it's well covered that Google pays billions of dollars to Apple in order to get that spot as the default search engine in Safari, and it sends loads of traffic Google's way. So why would they want to get people to stop using that and use their apps? Uh, well, there's a few reasons they might want to do this. Number one, browser search is declining. Uh, people are turning to other places. Reddit, TikTok, um, generative models like ChatGPT. So they may be trying to get ahead of an eventual decline in people using the browser to search. There's regulatory pressure. Uh, already in the EU, you have to give people a browser choice. Governments may mandate users choose their search at setup. And there's a chance that Apple would alter this deal at some point. Maybe they'll shut it down. Maybe they'll charge more than Google's willing to pay. Maybe somebody will outbid them. It's not impossible. For whatever reason, the current deal with Apple might fall apart. So how are they doing? The number of Google search queries on iPhone that come from Google's own apps has risen from 25 to 30 percent in the last five years. Uh, that's not a lot, but it's going the right direction. Apparently, Google wants to hit 50 percent eventually. The problem, ironically, is one that Google might need regulatory help with. It's difficult to overcome that default Safari browser search. That's how everybody uses search on their phone. Uh, at least in the EU, users have to be given a choice of browser at setup, so you might be able to get them to use Chrome. Uh, and maybe Google could do more to encourage that worldwide, since you can change your default browser in iOS uh, as it is anywhere right now. But does it strike anyone else on the panel that instead of restrict features to drive people to Android, Google finds itself in the position of having to say, let's enhance features on a competing platform to drive people to iOS apps? Well, I mean, I, I feel like some years ago it would have been, yeah, that's crazy. Of course, Google wants you know you to use its hardware and its software models in tandem you know, together. But that's just not the case with everybody. I mean, if you're Google and you want people to use Google search as much as possible, then yes, you're 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 going to have to embrace uh, a, a competitive network. Yeah, that's that's what competition looks like is essentially yeah. what you're saying there, right? Like this yeah. this is when you actually have uh, a, a playing field where people are equal. And maybe there's some anti-competitive outside of Google and Apple, but Google and Apple are are equal enough in this situation that Google has to pay attention to its iOS apps. It can't just try to force everyone onto Android because uh, that wouldn't work. Uh, you, you're going to want to encourage people to use the apps you have. Uh, also because uh, the search brow the browser search world isn't guaranteed forever. Uh, it might not even be one of those three reasons that I gave. It might be all three of those reasons that's making Google do this. How likely do you think it is that they can get people to use the apps? Because that's, that's my issue is when I want to search, I don't think to launch the Google app. And I know no, there's things like circle either. to search that are in there that aren't in the browser. On um, mobile, no. There's yeah. like no way I'm going to do that. I mean, unless, I don't know, something weird happens with my phone. But otherwise, no. I mean, you know, and, and I use iOS. On desktop, okay. Um, I do find it fascinating that uh, search in general, or at least traditional search, is on the decline. Um, and... I know, you know, yeah, many people, like you said, use TikTok or YouTube or, you know, a variety of things to find information. And I'm like, that's such a weird, like, it It still doesn't resonate with me all that much. You know, I'm like, I can't, like, have some rando person on TikTok telling me what the news is. If it's a trusted news source, sure. 
Um, so I guess there, there's that, but, but it's not always news. People aren't, aren't just searching for news. They're searching for like how to, how to make, you know, totally. udon with kimchi, which is exactly, exactly. what we did right. yesterday. We, and we used a TikTok uh, video yeah, to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know it's, it's, it's a different way because there's so much information now. Yeah. Um, earlier this morning I was looking up like a, a dance, like a dance that uh-huh. I don't know how to do. And I'm like, oh, wow. Like. Four million people have already posted. <laughs> yeah, stamps. absolutely. Like, I'm good. Do yeah. you ever see it going the other direction where Apple is trying to get people on Android to use its apps? Because I don't. No, nope. I feel like that's just nope. Nope. antithetical and to I how Apple works. I will not hold my breath on that either. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep. We'll uh, you know wait for you to tell us we were wrong when that happens. But I don't think it's going to happen. Indeed. Well, on Thursday, YouTube released an updated eraser tool for creators. Uh, To explain that, it's designed to help you remove copyrighted music that might be in your video. You know, maybe you made a video, maybe there's a song playing in the background kind of thing, might get taken down for that reason, etc., etc. But uh, it wouldn't affect any other audio in that same video with this new tool. That would be like, your dialogue or sound effects or just ambient audio in general. In a video explaining the tool, YouTube said it had been testing it for a while, lackluster results, but a new version is now using AI powered an AI powered algorithm to specifically detect and remove that one song without impacting the other audio in the clip. You know, maybe it's an hour long audio clip and it would be a whole thing for you to take up that that song otherwise. YouTube does warn, it's not perfect. The algorithm might fail to remove just the song in certain cases. Yeah, I, I, love, the, I love the idea here. Uh, obviously, like you said, it wasn't working well enough for them to launch it until now. So they, they must feel they've got it to be an acceptable level. Uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of other pressures for them to do this, unlike with Gemini, where they're like, oh, crap, OpenAI exists. We have to launch it even though we're not ready. Uh, but they didn't really demonstrate it in the video they did. So I wonder they how well it's all. going to work in practice, right? Yeah. Um, I, I know a lot of creators that run into this where they've got, uh, they're, they're, they're shooting in a cafe, you know, doing a review of a pastry and there's music that the cafe is playing yeah. and they're like, Oh crap, in the I hope you can't hear that, mm-hmm. you know, because, uh, I'll probably get dinged for copyright. Uh, and a lot of things don't make it to YouTube because of that, because they get dinged for copyright. So you, you have to be careful of that. This makes you not have to worry about that. You can have that thing in the background and go, well, if it does show up and ding me, I can have it removed if this tool works well enough. But that's what I'm wondering is like, does it work or does it kind of work? Right. Does it does it make the interview you're doing in the cafe feel like it was recorded naturally? Or is there some weird garbly thing in the background that's you're like, oh, they must have removed a song because it sounds a little weird. Yeah, that sort of struck me the same way as like, just give us one example, (laughs) even if it's like the best example possible. Just just one example of like how this would work and how it would uh, sound well. Um. Uh, YouTube also says if the tool doesn't successfully remove the claim on a video, then it you can choose to mute all sound in the claimed segments again where the where the song or you know anything copyrighted is heard. Trim out the claim segments um, or replace the song option in certain cases. Yeah, uh, those are all the those are the things that you could do already. They're like, yeah, if it doesn't work, you can still do the old stuff. Is essentially right. what they're saying. Right, right, right. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, but yeah, and you know, and YouTube also says if the removal of the claim uh, of the music does work, then the content ID claim. That's obviously YouTube system for identifying use of copyrighted content and different clips. That goes away too. So in practice. In, in, in theory, this is a great situation for anybody who's, yeah, a creator out and about, you know, there's just ambient stuff in the background that you have no control over, and or, or maybe you do, and later on you go, ah, I shouldn't have played that song, that kind of thing. You have options. More options is better if it works. Len, have you ever run into this? Because I know you you do videos from time to yeah, time. Yeah, I haven't done a video in a while like that. Usually the audio is just music 
for some of my drawings. But I did do one a couple years ago, and I was doing an explanation, and it was one of those things where, like, it was Madonna's holiday was in the background. So I'd like to go back to that video at some point and see how this tool works. Um, because if it works as well as they purport... Why was uh, Madonna's holiday in the background? You know, I was... <laughs> I was um, because he was celebrating. No, I was explaining something. I was, you know, and I happened. It was ambient music. But where and, were you? You know, where was I? Yeah, I was in Vegas. It oh, was, okay, okay. You weren't at home, just no. playing holiday in the background. No, by accident. I actually you, I was you, in yeah. one of the casinos. And you had like, no control over it. I had yeah, no okay, control. Gotcha, no, gotcha, no, gotcha. I didn't put Madonna's holiday on just for the heck of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, maybe I'll try that to see how it sounds. Uh, it sounds to me like it really depends on the uh, on on just the the, the file itself. Mm -hmm. um, and you know if it's if maybe if it's shorter, it it can it works better. But I have a feeling that if it's very clearly like there's my voice and there's the background music in the cafe, that it probably does really well. Sure. If it's Vegas where you've got Madonna's holiday and a bunch of people talking and yeah, casino ding, ding, noises, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. It probably wasn't going to work as well because sure. it's got too much to sort through. That's yeah, just a guess. It doesn't, it doesn't search out that song. Like it doesn't, do they, do we know if it does that or not? Like it's a, oh, well, it is... knows what the song is because the content ID identified it. So it because should it, be able it, to latch onto that song. Yeah. Gotcha. It's gotcha. just a question of whether it can take out just that, in a way that doesn't garble the rest of it, which is what the algorithm potentially can do, and, and it should be able to do that. Yeah. I mean, as a creator, and I know we've, you know, those of us who have been in this game for a while, um, sometimes this happens, sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's kind of obvious why um, a video got taken down type thing. Even if it was a little wonky, but still the video stayed up, I think that that's, that's a that's a good first step for a creator to be like, okay, I used this tool, I did what I could, you know, if it if it needs to like, I don't know, the video to be taken down, re-edited, uploaded, yeah. well that would be another thing. But this 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 seems like something that that is 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 really handy to have in your back pocket. You yeah. know, the, the other thing that's weird is that uh, I used to use a royalty-free music through YouTube and then eventually sometimes I got a I got a takedown notice because that is not royalty free anymore. Like suddenly, like how do you control? So that? you were using YouTube's provided royalty free music and then got a takedown for the royal. That's <laughs> yes. yeah, that's very YouTube. Yes, it's very confusing. Very yeah. confusing. But now you'll be able to swap out that for another royalty free piece of music <laughs> that will you last do it at least a year. Years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, folks, if you like watching videos on YouTube, you're going to want to watch Tom's Top 5. We put it up as a YouTube short, so it's it's not going to take up a lot of your day, but it's going to fill those 60 seconds with happiness, especially if you're an open source software fan or and or cheap and you just want free stuff that works really well. This week's Top 5 is open source software alternatives. You can catch it at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, at DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram, and YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. Len, you, you teach a graphic design class. Uh, am I correct in that? I do, yes. I will be teaching it again in a couple weeks to uh, high school students. So. Yeah, so so you run into parents and students and trying to explain digital arts to people a lot. And I know one of the questions you get frequently is, my kid wants to start drawing digitally uh, what can I do to help them out? Where should they start? So we thought we'd cover some tips for people uh, today of where they should start. Uh, what hardware should a starting digital artist go for? Sure. Well, you know, even um, it's not even kids. Sometimes it's a, adults who want to know. They want to get into it as well. Uh, and uh, but the big problem is cost, right? What do you want to? Where do you want to start? Um, Unfortunately, I'm not like really high tech. I mean, I, I use di uh, digital stuff. Uh, the big stuff that I use is uh, my Mac and my Cintiq. My Cintiq is an old Cintiq. It's over 12 years old. I think we're going And for anybody who doesn't know what a Cintiq is. A Cintiq is a, basically, it's a, a product made by the company Wacom. 
and it's a, a monitor. It's right in front of me here, and I just draw on it. And this is how I do most of my work uh, for clients, for DTNS. Uh, I use it in all kinds of different ways, uh, not only just digital drawing, but also in InDesign. Uh, and I use a lot of the Adobe Creative Suite. Uh, when I'm not using this big uh, Cintiq, this Wacom, I'm using uh, an Apple uh, Pencil and an iPad Pro. Uh, very, very simple. Um, and I usually tell uh, students or parents of students who want to get into it that they can, that's, it's, a, it's an investment. You're probably going to spend around 1500 on that. Uh, if, if you're a parent and you're like, I don't want to, I don't, that's a little bit rich for my blood. Uh, you can go to the Wacom website as well, and you can just look at stuff they have. They have things that are similar to iPads. Uh, they're not as strong, obviously, because they're only there to do one thing, which is to mm -hmm. draw. Uh, but you can get in and as an entry level at around 500 bucks, and uh, it comes with a stylus, I believe, and it's just a good way to start. Um, the thing that I would say if you're looking for uh, a, a digital option is to look for the biggest canvas size you can afford. Um, the reason why is because you go with like a 12 inch, uh, you probably want to go a little bit bigger than that uh, because uh, you're, you're, uh, if either you or your, your, uh, your kid might feel like they just they want a bigger canvas to work on. So try to look at the canvas size. Mm. Uh, and try to be as big as uh, go for the biggest size that you can afford because uh, you'll make your work feel more loose and free. Yeah, um, you know, I, I guess you would feel less bothered by having too much canvas than you would by having not enough. Because yes. when you have not enough, you can't draw that direction. Exactly. That was one of my early mistakes when I just had a small little uh, uh -huh. stylus and it was very small and I kept going off the end. If you go the uh, Apple uh, Pro, iPad Pro, uh, route, uh, the best software to use would be Procreate. Um, Procreate is, uh, I think it's, it's 20 bucks. It's not a subscription. Not bad. Uh, it's, it's fantastic yeah. and it's super not powerful. Bad. Now, it's not as powerful as the Adobe Creative Suite, which is what I do 90% of my stuff on is created on Adobe Creative Suite. However, there are a lot of, uh, of, just features on Procreate, which are super powerful. You can pretty much do a lot of what you can do on uh, on the Creative Suite through Procreate. There are limitations on layer size. So if you're creating a large image and you need to create more layers, you will there will you'll meet up with a uh, uh, you know they'll it'll stop you from adding yeah. more. Yeah, mm -hmm. they'll stop you from adding more. Um, but uh, it, there are some features on Procreate which I wish that Adobe would would work into mm. their uh, Photoshop because uh, it's because I find myself because I'm jumping between the two. I'm like things that I do on Procreate I can't do on Photoshop. So what about Canva? I know a lot of people mention Canva. Have you ever worked with that? So Canva is more of a graphic design uh, project uh, or you know product. Mm. And uh, this is interesting because I mentioned that I'm going to be teaching graphic design uh, to uh, pre-college students in a couple weeks. And this is the thing that even just like two years ago, I wasn't, I didn't have to really um, uh, deal with this issue, which is a, you know, Canva has a lot of AI b built into it. And you can just tell it to do something, templates, and it'll just do it for you. So why should you even take a graphic design class? Yeah, right. right? Well, um, yeah, that's a that's a huge question. How do you how do you stand out when anybody when I who have uh, admittedly no artistic talent in this direction right, could just pick up Canva and be like, make a thing that looks like Len, and then you know it'll spit it, it out. Exactly, and that's that's the issue. And what I tell my students uh, and uh, how they can stand out is um, I always tell them to don't sweat the workflow. Okay, hmm. like don't worry so much about. I don't know how to use this program. Uh, I really am bad at it, or I really don't feel comfortable doing this. Don't worry about that. Don't sweat that. Worry instead about uh, and focus on the conceptual part. Uh, AI is moving fast. However, uh, conceptually, the ideas and everything like that are, are still what's going to have you stand apart from AI and all everything else that is being made. Um, that's what will give you the edge 
uh, over the rest of the people in your field, set you apart from that crowd, uh, because the ideas, the the uh, the conceptual par- portion of it, is the important part. So I always tell my students, um, you know, and this is what I plan on telling them, is it really is about your own ideas, your concepts. Uh, focus on that, and I think you'll become a better designer, a better illustrator, a better whatever it is that you want to become. So I, I like that. Don't sweat the what did what did you say? Don't, don't sweat, sweat the, the workflow. The workflow, because yeah. basically what you're saying is, you know, learn the tools you need to learn. The tools yeah. are getting easier all the time. Yeah, it's it's knowing what you want to put on the page. That's the hard part. Exactly. So and yeah. I use the example of doing stuff for DTNS, which is, you know, I create usually a piece of art in about an hour. The only reason I know that is because I know the workflow pretty well. And then I can concentrate on the ideas and everything else. And so that's that's what I feel uh, new designers and new illustrators should focus on. Yeah. That's good stuff. Thank you, Len. Uh, you. Uh, we'll uh, we'll check back to find out uh, what you did illustrate uh, on yes. today's show uh, <laughs> after amazing. we look yeah. at the mailbag. We got a good one from Chris in Nova Scotia, an art teacher, who writes, I really enjoyed your conversation on AI use in grading on Wednesday show. We were talking about grading school papers and projects and the like. Chris says, I teach high school art, and I really appreciated Scott's perspective on how he could see these tools being used in an art classroom. My district discourages us from using AI tools for grading, citing privacy issues with feeding student work into an AI model, but we're very positive on AI as a whole. Our district will even purchase chat GPT plus for teachers who want it using funds that traditionally were reserved for textbooks. Chris says, personally, I now view tools like ChatGPT as an essential part of my job. It's exceptional at helping me understand design projects that meet my learning outcomes and new, uh, in new and creative ways. Incredible at generating assessment rubrics. So even without using AI to grade work, I still reap the time-saving benefits of these tools when it comes to planning. And you're all correct. Any time saved in planning and grading is time spent making things better for students. I am a better teacher because of ChatGPT. Interesting. Yeah, uh, I thought I thought as a fellow cr- uh, cr- teacher creator yeah. that, that that you'd you'd find that email interesting. Line. Yeah, you know, um, I have a me personally, I have a love hate relationship with AI. Um, I, I I see sort of the dangers that maybe, especially for young students who are learning it. Uh, but I also use it myself in order just to kind of get a, uh, just to start the juices flowing, the creative juices flowing. One thing that happened, I haven't taught for a year at the collegiate level. However, uh, at that point, uh, there were students who were using AI. And I had to tell them, as long as you're using it ad- to, to generate ideas, like, you know, your the concepting, uh, that's okay. Don't let it do your work for you. Yeah. So there's a place for it. Because so, yeah. their work will be better than than the end result that it sticks out. I, I, I would one would expect. hope. One yeah. would hope. Uh, yeah. Another thing for Chris to realize, uh, some of those products that we talked about when we were discussing that Wall Street Journal article uh, earlier this week, avoid the privacy issues that ChatGPT has. Because I understand why a school district would say, do not put student information into ChatGPT. <laughs> uh, but these products are made specifically, kind of like medical AI products are made to comply with HIPAA. These products are made specifically to comply with privacy requirements from from uh, from school districts. So you might want to take a look at that. Uh, well, thank you, Len, for being with us today. If you have anything else uh, you would like to tell us about, uh, like, you know, a drawing you made of today's topic, <laughs> yes. uh, what, what, go you ahead. Know, it's it's, it's know. interesting. You know, this is the f- I've been doing this show with you for 10 years. I, I, I haven't done something like this before, which been a, a guest in this capacity. But uh, you mentioned that line, don't sweat the workflow. And that's kind of what this image is all about. Oh, uh, I nice. put it down. Uh, it says, "Don't sweat the workflow. You can learn that. W- you can learn that. Worry instead about the conceptual, the ideas. Hopefully, that's what will set you apart from the crowd. This includes AI. 
And the example here I've used is that banana flamingo <laughs> I drew from a couple weeks ago. Yeah. That that was not AI generated. That came out of my weird mind. So Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and also, so the drawing also, is of I, you I coming up with you. the AI flamingo. Yeah, yeah because right, the, you're uh, wearing flamingo. the same t-shirt. I am. Yes, there's the painted pickle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is it's there's actually there's happened. There's many nuances time. here. I mean, if you want to see one. how Len sees himself creating, this is this is your chance to do it. That's great. I love this. Thank you. Where oh, do people uh, go to get? Yes, you can go to uh, my online store, lenperaltastore.com, where you can you can actually purchase this. Or uh, if you'd like to support me in other ways, patreon.com forward slash len, back me at the DTNS lover level. And you'll get this image and remind you that your brain is still more powerful than AI. Yeah, this Unless is your brain on, on art. Drugs. Exactly. <laughs> uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, so we always like to have a little fun at the end of the week. And we're going to do a balance game. Uh, which would you rather have? We ask the participants, Sarah and Len, uh, and Roger and myself, uh, which of two choices they would rather have. And uh, who knows? Their answers may surprise you. <laughs> you can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern at 2000 UTC. You can find out more about how to do that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend. We'll be back on Monday doing it all again. See ya. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer, Joe Kuntz. Producer at large, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Dutterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows included Chris Christensen and Scott Johnson. Our guest this week was David Spark. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>